So the Mets are now two and three on the season, which, by the way, that's the exact same record of the 86 Mets before they won 11 straight. And we draw that connection between those eras to honor our guest tonight. He has a new book. It is called Game 7, 1986, Failure and Triumph of the Biggest Game of My Life, a key member of that World Series winning team and current Mets broadcaster for SNY. Ron Darling joins us. Great to see you, Ron. It's so great to see you. It's, it's been a while. Great to see you always at the ballpark. Which, yep. by the, All right, we're going to get to this book here in just sure, a minute, sure. but let's, let's touch on the, the Mets right now. Um, the core of this team is clearly the rotation, and they are all aces, but if they all get paid by like aces, this is going to be a billion-dollar rotation. I mean, this, the fact is... They're not going to be able to hang on to all of these guys. So the next three years really is a critical window for them, isn't it? Yeah, I think, and I think you shouldn't even worry about that kind of stuff. Um, uh, professional sports always seem to sort themselves out. So what you think you have today, you might not have down the road. So I think just if you're a fan or you're a fan of the game, you just enjoy these young pitchers going out and doing their craft every fifth day because they're all so excellent but all so different that every day you got a new kind of uh, uh, way to look at things. It is fun to watch every one of these guys, but I'm curious to find out from your expertise, which one or two of these pitchers do you see evolving to a next level pitcher? They all have the yeah. firepower, but which one will take it to the next level? Well, that's the, that's the issue. I, I'm asked this all the time, and I, and I know why you're asking it. But they're so good, I think they all can go there. Think about it. When Wheeler comes back, Zach Wheeler comes back after the All-Star break, they'll have a rotation. If you looked around baseball and said, we want the 20 best arms that are 27 years or younger, five of them are going to be in the Mets rotation. That's just unheard of when you think about yeah. it. And they all can go to the next level. Will they? Um, I think some of them in games have done it already. And, uh, but but I think they're they're all excellent and they're all power pitchers right. as well. But does that power come at a cost of control of strategy? I don't think it comes uh, with control. I, I think uh, as far as uh, their control or control of them, um, I, I think they're, they're right where they want to be. The only thing you have with power pitchers we've seen is that uh, injury can come into play. And um, let's just hope they stay healthy because healthy they'll be great. Confidence. I really want to talk about confidence because that's something you wrote about quite a bit in your book. Mm. Um, you called the 86 team the greatest collection of type A personalities <laughs> yeah, yeah. that you have ever been around. I mean, this is a team that didn't just want to beat the opposition. You guys wanted to embarrass them. And that, that your opposition always knew that that was a possibility. So you instilled fear in them in, in a way, didn't you? Yeah, it was, uh, it was almost it was before its time. Like, we really wanted them to tap out, you know, every night. Well, you that's know? an effective weapon. I mean, it kind of what. What, what it was. Now, we didn't always do that, and we, uh, we got our hat handed to us uh, ourselves at times, but uh, it was an interesting group. Um, you know, it, it's hard. Everyone knows everything about the team by, by now, but uh, really what I wanted to do in this book is that look at it in a different perspective. Uh, this team had so much success, but you don't always uh, uh, have success. The book is called Game 7, 1986, Fear and Triumph in the Biggest Game of My Life. Um, a bittersweet tale of your Game 7, but how cathartic was it for you to write this book? Um, incredibly cathartic. It's almost like I've been able to release and let my baseball playing days go. You know, I'm a, a broadcaster now, and uh, I don't know, whatever that means. And, uh, and I think that when you're a young kid and you're standing over, we had the Masters today, you're standing over a three-foot putt, you're trying to make it to win the U.S. Open or the Masters. You're trying to sink a free throw when you're 10 years old is to win the NBA championship. Um, I think if you're a major league pitcher, you want to pitch game seven. You want to have a chance to pitch your team to the World Series. I got that chance and didn't pitch very well. And I was so joyful when the team won. I was so joyful the next day of the parade. But two days later, I was sitting in my apartment and I was like, what happened? Like, that's, that was, should have been my moment. Why didn't I do better? And than you've I did? been sitting with this yeah. for 30 years. You needed to release this at some point, didn't you? Well, I didn't have, I mean, it's not a major thing out there because the Mets won the championship. I've got a ring, all that stuff. But it did stick in my craw. And I thought that to write about it might be a cool thing because it'll show people out there, doesn't matter how successful you are, you can go through certain times where you talked about confidence. Really good players in the major leagues have confidence. The great players have belief. And I never could make that bridge from confidence to belief. Well, let me 
just go ahead and set the record straight in case people forget about this. This was the, your third start of the series. So they'd seen you for two straight games before that. Not two straight games, but two games yeah. before that. And before that, um, there were no earned runs in 14 innings yeah. that you allowed. Uh, game seven, you wrote that I let myself believe that it would be a battle instead of a cakewalk. That was a 26-year-old you, <laughs> armed with the knowledge that you have right now at 55. How could you have done anything differently before the game? I don't know. I think it was, uh, you know, I was always accused of being a, a guy who thought too much, who tried to be too perfect, too fine, all that stuff. And that used to uh, grate on me. I hated it. And uh, as I went through this book and started writing about it, especially Game 7, the paralysis by analysis that I suffered uh, really let me know that a lot of those people that had those criticisms when I played, they might have been right, or part of it was right. So I, it really affected me because maybe part of it was right. And, uh, and it's a good thing to get it off your chest. You know, those are the things that I think as a ball player, we always look back and say, boy, if I'd done this or that, I could have had a better baseball card. And you know what? No. Your baseball card reflects exactly who you were, and I'll take what I got. Well, in that game, you also wrote about the delay. Uh, there was a collapse of the stands, of the temporary stands on, on the side of the ballpark, um, and that couldn't have come at a worse time for you. Hey, listen, I have all the excuses in the world. Like you said, you know, I, I pitched a couple I'm times. I'm ready today. to team up for you. I, 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 the, the temporary stands. No, there, there's, uh, this book will tell you there's absolutely no excuses. Uh, what is, is, is what is. And w what happens, and I remember Mel Stottlemyre said it to me a couple of times, and it didn't really resonate until I finished this book. Uh, when, you, when I would struggle in a game, I'd always ask him, you know, what did I do wrong? He said, well, nothing. The other team's trying too. And I think that's what you come back with, is that, yes, I didn't do things like I should have done. Um, there were things I could have changed. But the Boston Red Sox had a lot to do with that, too. They had an excellent team. Yeah, you talked about confidence and how difficult it is. It's a fine line. In fact, I think one of the lines you, you wrote in the book, it is a fine line between dominating someone yeah. and being dominated. Is confidence that important of a role in, in these games? Well, I think that everyone comes at it in a different way. I think some guys are just uber confident. Uh, they have those kind of personalities. I was just one of those guys who succeeded because I had a fear of failure. My thing was I got a lot of people that are watching me from a small hometown and they're expecting me to do well and I'm not blaming it on them, I'm blaming it on myself, that's all I feel inside. But that my thing was can't fail, I've got to succeed. That's a lot of pressure to put on yourself. Right, right. And, um, and I think th those are things that now in my life now as a guy in front of the camera, I mean, there's, you know, a million, two million, three million people watching Every night. at times when I do the postseason. And never, ever do I have a doubt that I'll somehow pull it off. But I did have doubts as, as a player, which I think is remarkable to me because I trained my entire life to be a player, <laughs> and I never did any training well, to, this be, just, uh, to be in front of the camera. This just comes naturally uh, to I, you. I don't know about that. You should uh, watch some of the broadcasts. It's not that natural sometimes. I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that Davey Johnson didn't have the best relationship with pitchers. But in today's game, how important it is for the manager's role with the pitching staff. Are you surprised there aren't more managers with a background in pitching? Um, yeah, there's only, there's only a couple. Hey, listen, uh, most managers when I played, they would have loved to play the game without the pitchers. You know, just get them off the field. You know, they don't want to watch you. <laughs> but, but it's I, a different game. It is a different game. And I think the managers, especially in this town, um, you know, Joe, of course, with the Yankees. Um, um, but here, because I get to see them all the time, Terry Collins and Dan Worth, and they're just so fantastic at communicating with their athletes. It's a different day. When I played, if the manager or the general manager did not speak to you the entire year, it was a successful year. It means that you didn't do anything wrong. Now it's different. Guys want to really communicate, and I think that's a good thing. You're a good communicator. Does that world ever interest you? I think I'm a very good communicator when it comes to being on TV. I think one to one, maybe not so much. I've been asked a couple times to, to put the uniform back on. Right. Um, those days are done. With this book, those <laughs> days are done. A lot of topics in here we sure. didn't get to touch on. Doc and Straw's real relationship. At the end of game six, you were on a highway. Ray Romano was your delivery guy. Right. Partying with Tyson and De Niro. Um, I, 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 this is such a great book. Uh, the book is called Game 7, 1986, Failure and Triumph, the Biggest Game of My Life. Ron Darling, thank you so much for coming in and, and sharing your stories with us. Thanks for having me on. You are the best. Very thank much you. appreciated. We'll see you at the ballpark. All right. <laughs>